Good afternoon and welcome to the Headland Group PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors are being in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. Have a review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Chris Payne, Interim Chief Executive of Headland Group PLC. Good afternoon, Chris. Afternoon and uh, afternoon, everybody else, and thanks for joining the um, webinar today. Um, just on the first slide, um, just a short agenda here. So just give you a, a bit of an overview of Headland, and perhaps I'll spend a little bit longer on that slide than perhaps I otherwise would do for, for those who don't know the Headland story. Um, a, a brief summary of the trading update that we have um, produced last week, uh, a summary of the strategy and an update on what we've been doing over the last year or so. Um, and in particular on ESG, which we published um, for the first time in May uh, 2021, and, and then a summary at the end. So, uh, yeah, interim chief executive at the moment. So I've been with the business for four and a half years, um, CFO. Uh, I'm double hatting at the moment until the board has uh, appointed a, a successor. So hopefully that will be concluded uh, in relatively short order. Um, I've had a number of sort of commercial and finance roles over the years, most recently as part of the sort of um, IPO team at BIFA where I was in a sort of group commercial role. So, yep, that's me, and um, I'll talk through the slides today. So, Headlam overview. Um, so, this is us, Headlam on a slide. Um, been listed and, and operating for 30 years. Uh, as I said, I'll take a little bit more time over this, perhaps, than I normally would. Um, Headlam effectively is, is a market-leading business uh, which um, operates purely in the B2B space. So we're a distribution business, and we bridge the uh, manufacturing of floor coverings with um, retailers and fitters effectively. So we're that kind of middleman, if you like. Um, and what does that mean for us? So that means that we are a national uh, offer of, of market leading. Um, that means we have to have deep stocks um, across many, many different types of product ranges manufactured, mostly in the UK and in Western Europe. There's a little bit from further afield, but for the vast majority of our products, over 70%, in fact, are manufactured in the UK, Belgium and Netherlands. Um, and, and why is that important? So it's difficult for manufacturers to, to meet and, and reach the small kind of endpoints, the, the, the high street independent retail shops, the, the, the men in van fitting type customer groups. And that accounts as to why we've got 25,000 different customers. They are typically quite small in nature. Um, they may not have any premises at all. And we're that kind of key function really that, that takes the, the mass kind of produced manufacturing down to the small independent retailer who maybe only wants one or two rooms cut for a particular customer. So as I said, that's quite a compelling proposition for an independent retailer. And, and some have said that perhaps that's why the independent carpet store on the high street has actually done relatively well uh, in, a, in a retail environment, which has seen a lot of, um, a lot of high streets uh, disappear. So you know, we can offer uh, credit terms to these, these people who run these shops, um, and we offer a next day service. So any time that um, from a from a consumer perspective, you do go into a high street uh, carpet shop and, and ask to look at some product and they say, uh, well, that will take three weeks uh, and they ask for a cash deposit. Um, from their perspective, we can deliver next day across a, a huge collection of, of different products and supply um, and we'll offer credit terms. So they, they've got a pretty good working capital position to work from. Um, and that's so that's why it's important. and That's why it's been successful. Um, I have talked about this sort of different customer groups, and this is something that's been emerging and I'll dwell on in our strategy slides later. Um, we've been very good and very deep at servicing this sort of local high street independent retailer and the local fitters, but less uh, less deep and, and less uh, a lo much lower share of the other, the other customer groups. And I'll talk a bit more about that in detail. Um, we're a highly cash generative business, so we've got strong balance sheet. Um, um, there's a slide I'll talk about the balance sheet later, but Effectively, we've got strong cash generation, strong net funds on the balance sheet, and we own the freeholds of our distribution centre estate. We've got lots of long-serving people with great industry knowledge and depth of knowledge. And there's a few facts and figures on the right-hand side of the slide, um, which talk to the scale of the business. Um, we've got a number of different sales brands, and, and we call them businesses, but they're effectively sales brands operating from 20, 21 distribution centres. Um, we offer a number of trade counters that we're looking to grow and, and double over the next couple of years. 
and I'll talk to them about a little bit more in, in the strategic slides. Um, and the, the number of sort of commercial vehicles that we use to distribute the products around the country has actually decreased. So that's um, a result of some efficiency measures that we've been carrying out. And again, I'll cover that um, in, in a later slide. But just to turn to the um, trading update that, that I uh, distributed on Thursday. So we, we updated the market on Thursday, uh, year end uh, 31st of December. So we're, this is just a pre close. Um, we'll publish our results on. Uh, the uh, first week, of, end of the first week of March. So we can see quite a positive um, bounce back from the COVID um, affected 2020 and a really strong uh, bounce back in 21. Profits uh, have returned pretty much back towards um, levels that we saw prior to the uh, COVID impact. Uh, and, and that's both in the UK and Europe. We have a couple of businesses, in fact, three businesses in two countries overseas, um, which is a relatively modest part of the business. Um, and that's seen a strong bounce back as well as the UK. UK that does very much dominate the, the business model. Um, what we also seen is, and we report on regularly, is a split in the business between residential and commercial. And there's a slide that will illustrate that in a little bit more detail on the, on the next page. But in essence, what that means is that our products are destined for use in the residential environment. Um, and typically it's, it's sort of carpets, and laminates and the like. Uh, and some of our products are destined for more commercial use, whether it's offices, um, hospitality, doctor surgeries and that kind of thing. And that might be a much harder wearing safety floor or it might be um, sort of carpet tiles and the like. And we tend to split our products into those two groups. And we report them as segmental splits in our results. And what we have seen over the last um, year, two years, is definitely a, 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 a a continued positivity of the residential market and we've all seen um, businesses who are retail facing residential and, and home related products doing very well uh, ourselves included and we did very well on that side double digit growth um, on the retail and residential side of our market but on the on the contrast we were held back uh, by the commercial performance which we've seen being quite difficult and we are in our rmi business so we're not in the big project end of the scale where um, so if a, a new hospital or a big fit out would be done, uh, manufacturers would tend to sell those types of commercial products direct to the installers. So we are much more in the fit out refurbishment, small in small room by room refurbishment. And that part of the commercial sector has been quite slow. Um, and we've seen a sort of double digit um, softness in that market. Um, and that really then talks to what what to come and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. But um, I think that the, the outturn for 22 and, and beyond, um, everyone in the market on the commercial side is expecting that to bounce back at some point. But I think those two um, those two competing uh, impacts on the retail and commercial side um, largely offset, and we've seen the uh, as I said, seen the revenue perform uh, remarkably well and bounce back strongly. Um, the, there's a, just a one liner on here about the industry wide issues, and, and you would have seen lots of this conversation in the public and in the press around driver shortages, particularly distribution businesses. And that's something we've been able to mitigate. We've got a really very strong, loyal uh, driver community. Um, we did take some vehicles out earlier in the year, which meant we were able to sort of concentrate our uh, driver numbers. Um, and also, we were able to largely pass on much of the inflationary pressures on the product side that we've seen. Uh, to our customers. Um, now that's something that's not necessarily unusual in our industry. So products do go up, certainly after the sterling devaluation of a few years ago. And as consumers, you may only replace your flooring every five to 10 years. So if there has been some price inflation, it's not necessarily something that you may notice. Obviously our customers are more um, concerned about price inflation, but typically as distributor, we can tend to pass those sort of price rises on. Just a, a short summary on early trading in 22. Again, encouraging. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but um, I think we have seen a good start to January. Um, last year was quite difficult. Um, softer comparatives as non-essential retail was closed uh, in England and around the country. Um, so I'm not surprised that we've seen comparatives, but it has been particularly encouraging um, start of the year. We've also talked about this sort of potential return of surplus capital to shareholders. We published our capital allocation priorities in 2021. And as I say, we are a, a cash generative business. Um, we don't have a high degree of capital intensity to what we do. Um, and therefore we think there is an opportunity to distribute some of that surplus capital that we've built up over the last year or two um, 
and we will be announcing further information on that uh, in March. So I've got a couple of slides, which um, the last of publicly available information that we've produced was really from the half year. So I, I did a set of slides and presented to the market um, in September. And these slides, a couple of slides from, from that deck, uh, and obviously these will be rolled forward and updated in March. But it does give uh, an indication of the shape and scale of the business, and particularly those who are new to the Headlam story, it's, it's worth just sort of dwelling on these things. Um, some of the comparatives are a bit uh, difficult because of 2020 sort of weakness, particularly in the first half. So, in some of our um, commentaries, um, we have used uh, 2019 as a comparative um, because that's more of a sort of reference year, if you like, before the effects of COVID. And, and the results that we've seen in 21 and, and in early 2022 are much more aligned with the 2019 results. So, you can see in this chart that we've got this sort of residential and commercial split. Um, I've always uh, in the past referred to that as two thirds, one third, but the relative strength of residential in the last couple of years has moved that dial a little bit further. So 68, 31, 68 and a half, 31 and a half. And indeed the UK and continental Europe has also slipped towards the UK um, because we disposed of our Swiss subsidiary uh, during 2021. So again, increasingly UK centric and a slight move towards residential. Operating margins are a big target and, and indeed gross margin, but ultimately operating margin are a big target for me and the business. Um, and it's something that we said that we are targeting and, and looking to improve. And we set ourselves a challenge in the next uh, year or two of getting to 7.5% operating margin, um, which is obviously a big step up on what we're currently doing and what we've seen in the last couple of years. But we've got a clear line of sight on how we're delivering that uh, and, the, and the moving parts that are going to get us there. So at the bottom of this slide, we do talk about the resumption of normalised dividends, um, and we're expecting that to be announced in March. And as I said, uh, in addition to that, um, a sort of return of surplus capital as well. So I've left this chart in. So slide five, this is our daily sales chart. Um, and um, I think there, there's two things really to pick out. I do spend a bit of time um, talking uh, to investors about this particular chart. So in one respect, you can say, well, that's remarkably consistent. All the lines are pretty close together, which is true. But there have been some big changes that we've seen um, on the sort of COVID effect and that big V-shaped curve that you can see uh, was during the lockdown period that we saw in 2020. And if anything, this our business probably did reflect the, um, the Chancellor's desire for this sort of V-shaped recovery, and it was pretty much quickly back to where it was in the past. I think the other takeaway from this slide for me is, yes, it's consistent, but it also reflects, I think, that there is, there's a great opportunity for us to really drive some growth into the business. I think we've been quite flat for a number of years, um, and that plays out in the strategy and the focus of me and, and my energy towards kind of growing the top line um, as, a, as a key objective and a key part of our strategy for the future. Um, and, and as market leader, uh, we've got a great opportunity to grow share um, because of the way that the customer segmentation um, uh, is, is set. And I've got a slide uh, in a couple of pages time to, to kind of illustrate that point. But as I said, that we do spend a little bit of time talking to investors about this slide because of the consistency and the uh, reliability of the demand curve. But I see that as an opportunity for more growth. I mentioned the strong balance sheet. Um, and th th this sort of illustrates the point. Numbers clearly are out of date because they relate to June, but a couple of things worth dwelling on. The um, property plant and equipment dominated by the freehold properties. Uh, the distribution centres that we operate across the country are owned and freehold sites. Um, and therefore, when we have invested in new sites like Ipswich, for example, that was opened um, uh, last year, and we were able to dispose of a couple of the freeholds that we owned and, and became vacant as a result of that consolidation. So it does mean it does mean that we've retained some flexibility and can uh, return some cash um, when those uh, become surplus requirements. The other thing to note in here is a strong cash position and, and really strong balance sheet. So deep inventory position, which is largely funded by the supplier credit terms um, and a good deal of cash that we sit with the balance sheet because just simply the profit that we make on our on our business does tend to drop through to operating cash. Just literally re renegotiated the uh, banking facility. So on the 17th of January, we entered into a, a new facility. 
uh, and that's a very good long tenure out to 26 plus one so a, a good facility um, with a club arrangement which we'll talk more about in our march results um, but that's a, a refresh facility which gives us good firepower uh, to take forward i've had a question from uh, matthew r um, which i'll perhaps pick up at the end but i think that banking facility will play into the answer uh, for, for that particular question at the end Um, so just turning to strategy and some of the business changes that we have been implementing and, and what I see as the key objectives and, and um, areas of focus going forward. Um, we've had a, a really strong uh, shareholder register um, and they've been patient with us where we've been talking about our plans to improve the quality of the business and indeed our share of the market. And this is an area that we've been able to talk in a bit more detail and really get some excitement into um, the customer segmentation work that we've done. So we focused our initial kind of change program on delivering cost savings, improving efficiencies, and I mentioned the reduction in the commercial fleet, and that was that was one of those changes. Um, but really, the main prize for me is around growing our top line, uh, getting some kind of organic growth back into the business, and seeing us take some more of the share. Now, given our market leading position, you may think that's going to be a challenge. Um, but as this sort of slide evidence is at the bottom of the slide, you can see um, the work that we've been doing to identify the different types of customers. I mentioned we're very strong in the traditional retailers, the high street independent shops that might only have one, one store, uh, and the green box next to it, tradespeople and fitters who typically operate without uh, a retail premises. That's our kind of heartland and where we've been strong for many years. Um, and where we've had less share and less of the um, of the market is more to the right hand side so the large house builders the major multiple retailers the people like b and q home base um, wix and um, some of the diy sheds are in those categories and we've had very little um, share of that market they've tended to go direct to manufacturers but we do actually have quite a compelling offer for businesses at that end of that particular range and this is where we feel we are significantly underweight and where a lot of our efforts around organic growth are now centered This is really a summary of the things that we have been doing. And I, I mentioned um, the, the work on the efficiency um, and some of the cost reductions that we've seen. And also it starts to talk about the proposition builds on the right hand side of this slide, um, which are now starting to pay early dividends uh, in uh, sort of new contract wins and expansion into new territories and new customer segments. So we worked hard initially on consolidating our uh, network and also integrating the transport. And this comes about because of the, the, the past and the history that um, the Headlam has come from. So those who are new to the Headlam story, um, it's probably worth me just dwelling on that. So Headlam, 30 years uh, strong, um, was built up through acquisition. Um, and those acquisitions were only partly integrated. And we were left with a collection of businesses operating from distribution centers that in some cases do and have competed with each other and they compete for sales, but also we have, um, or we did have a situation where our distribution networks overlapped um, and we were sending the same product in many cases in different directions on vehicles um, uh, across borders. So clearly some inefficiency and the opportunity for us to improve not only the kind of customer service, because in some cases customers with multiple accounts would get multiple deliveries, um, but also reduce our cost base and improve the kind of carbon uh, effect of um, the uh, competing de delivery networks. So we went through a process to, um, to, to look at how do we consolidate our network and now we have a situation where our customers are delivered to from the closest postcode. So that means the distribution centers are now effectively delivering um, to their customers that are closest to them regardless of which distribution center or which business originated the order. So that's had quite a big impact on our um, vehicle numbers, driver headcount, um, reduce the cost, reduce the emissions, etc. So that's quite a big project that we completed um, over the last 18 months. Trade counters, um, I talked to, and there's a slide a little bit further on uh, in this deck. But one of the areas that we noticed was um, particularly important during the COVID lockdown, and many of you would have experienced this in your home lives, is the ability to kind of continue to trade without a premises. So being able to order online, click and collect, uh, and then turn up a site and collect your order. 
And that's something that our customers have also enjoyed doing and wish they could do more. And we saw a, a significant improvement uh, in the kind of collection criteria for our customers. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed is that our trade counter offer is compelling and good and gets great feedback, but isn't in enough locations and doesn't offer um, kind of breadth of um, impulse purchases or this, products that maybe our fitters and customers need uh, on the day. So adhesives and gripper rods and all those kind of ancillary products. So we developed a new trade counter blueprint and uh, a new rollout program, which is to double our uh, trade counter network over the next couple of years. Um, and that is with a much broader offering of product that self pick. Um, we can offer a, an enhanced click and collection um, process for our customers and even sort of design and build um, areas for them to um, unroll their product and prepare it on the site under a covers canopy to keep it out of the weather. So a real kind of improvement in customer service. Obviously it goes hand in hand in that is the e-commerce and digital um, offer that we've had to invest in. So I inherited a business, I think, which was underinvested in the digital offer by a traditional customer base. But as we've seen in many parts of the, the industry and, and different sectors, I've seen a, a rush towards sort of e-commerce and digital offer. Probably flooring is a little bit left behind in some of those um, aspects, but um, certainly the COVID experience that we saw more people demanding um, online consumption um, and being able to see and feel products remotely with you know visualization software and like, and that's all uh, projects that we've invested in and delivered over the last 12 months. So there's a slide coming up where we talk about a new app that we've launched aimed at this particular customer group. Um, that does improve that, that service and gives our customers the ability to place an order end-to-end, -end, uh, source, look at products, look at prices, place an order, pay for product, and see what it might look like uh, in a home. Salesforce effectiveness, this is where we rebalanced the sales costs that we addressed the market in, looking at the new customer segment. So I mentioned earlier, we were very strong in the independent retail sector uh, and arguably over-costed in that space as well, too many heads selling into that space. We've been able to reduce those heads and actually invest more headcount in the areas of the customer groups where we were light. So we've we've hired a new sales team focusing on the key accounts areas and, and going after those large retailers with some success that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on and also in our March update. So customer propositions, I mentioned those earlier, we've been working hard at building a bespoke offer rather than just um, rather than just a sort of one size fits all, clearly something that's that's being offered to a local high street independent retailer as a proposition will be completely insuitable for um, somebody like Homebase who needs a national offer with consistent product, consistent service, consistent pricing, um, and with a sort of covenant of somebody that they can work with and trust. Just moving on, I mentioned this sort of industry leading e-commerce offer that we've got. We've developed a trade um, app over the last six months, which is now live with all of our customers. Um, this is the first in the industry um, and is this sort of um, capable of being looked at on a tablet or an iPad or, or an Android phone. Um, and it gives our customers access to all of our uh, different brands, all of our different stock holdings, price points, and they can check live stock holding um, for any particular order, said they can place orders through the app um, and get their terms that they've negotiated with us under their uh, B2B um, contract setup. Um, and it includes a sort of room visualizer. So a couple of the good features that the customers really enjoyed um, is being able to look at all of their stock holdings and, and then understand what the delivery times might be. And to be able to show their customers, remember this is a B2B offer, they can show their customers what the flooring would look like uh, in the customer's home. Um, and uh, even more than that, they can actually produce invoices with the customer's prices on using our costs as the as a sort of input cost, if you like. Um, so all of that is, is available on the app um, and customers have been uh, giving really positive feedback. What we have seen is a, a significant increase in the amount of online orders we've been able to take. So the percentage of our orders taken digitally um, reached a, a high point in December of uh, 26%. So that's the high point that we've seen um, up from 11% or so two or three years ago. So a real significant step forward in our digital offer. This is the um, 
uh, the, the sort of large independent retail um, segment that we talked about. And this is um, a third of the market, believe it or not. So there's a billion pounds of the three billion pound market sat in this space. And we have very little uh, share. And certainly we are underweight. And this is where we are targeting. Um, so, so Mark W has asked me a question, which I, I'll say I'll, I would have answered at the end, but it's a good, good time to, for me to sort of address that while I'm looking at this slide. So the, typically the, um, these, these types of customers would buy directly from manufacturers and they would ship them into their own DCs, have to double handle, have to work with potentially a number of different suppliers um, and then distribute around their own network. We can offer them a different type of service where we still source the product from manufacturers, but we step in the middle um, and we then offer a bespoke service where we can um, clearly source from multiple different suppliers and we can actually break it and, and offer a kind of store by store package for the um, for the retailers. So they don't have to ha handle these big bulky products in their distribution centers. It clogs up a lot of space. It's a bit of a specialist product to handle. And we can offer that as a bespoke service. So the manufacturers still get to, still get to make ship the product, but actually they're doing it in bulk via us, and we act as an intermediary. Um, that offers a, a sharper, more compelling service to the retailer, unclogs their DCs. Um, yes, they have to pay a bit more than they would have done to the manufacturers, but they get a better quality service and they avoid quite a considerable amount of cost. So that's how hopefully that answers your question, Mark. But uh, in essence, that means that we're able to sit in the middle take some value out of that, that chain and offer a, a really good leveraged operationally geared service to our customer groups. This slide um, talks about the uh, trade counters um, and there's a little picture down there of the types of um, ancillary purchases that I was describing. So um, up until now, our trade counters have been um, rather a sort of last minute addition to our distribution centers rather than a professionally run, dedicated, um, you know, make no bones about it. This this is designed to be a screw fix or a tool station or a, a, a more of a building product type feel. So you walk in, it will feel like a retail environment. You would have ordered your product for collection. You can see and self pick a load of the other products that you've forgotten to buy, like adhesives and gripper rods and, uh, and screen and the like. And we also have some dedicated kind of ranges of products that are available on sample boards, which you can just see if you look carefully on the left hand side of this slide um, uh, in the picture. So there are dedicated trade offers um, and is it been extremely well received by our customers so far. And we've got such a broad range of different trade counter experiences out there. What we're looking to do is standardize and double the size of the trade counters and also look to double the turnover and the contribution that that makes to the group over the next few years. So the early feedback and the early performance of those um, trade counters that we have opened and we have refurbished is really positive in line with the business case, in line with the step up in performance that we would have expected. So this is not just a case of doubling the numbers of trade counters, we're also refurbishing the existing 50 sites. We did 12 um, during 2021 uh, and we've got 20 um, on the list for 2022. So it will take a few years um, and we're going to increasingly run fast uh, and faster uh, as we get more practiced and uh, we start to hone in on, on the thing that works uh, the best and the blend uh, of product and range. Um, we're getting towards the sort of end of the slide deck now. This is just a slide I popped in because one of the things that has been a change in the last year or two is around improving the depth and range and quality of the board. Um, and I say I've been in the business for four and a half years and there's been quite a new few changes around the board table since then. Um, we've appointed two new non-executives in the year, um, both of whom come from the commercial um, side of, uh, of the world. So they're um, Simon, in Simon's case, he was the chief executive of Wix. And I mentioned the DIY sheds as being a, a key customer segment for us to grow into. So he's providing some great insight into the propositions that will work for that particular category. Uh, and Stephen joins us, who's an acting chief executive at the moment um, uh, in a FTSE business. So he's provided some great kind of um, support to me as well, personally, as I as I take on the role um, on the interim basis, just to kind of get my head around um, what, it's, what it is to be a chief exec and, and providing some good feedback and, uh, and some ideas on some of the commercial side of, of business as well. So great teams coming together 
forming a strategy and the strategy is something that I've been running with for a couple of years. So it's been great to sort of road test and bounce it off the, uh, the new board um, as they've joined. Just the last bullet there um, I mentioned, it's worth sort of dwelling on that. Um, the board felt it was important to do a sort of independent search for the next chief executive, which I'm, I'm part of, um, and hopefully we'll conclude that in the matter of weeks. So just um, a couple of slides to go. Um, capital allocation, I, I mentioned that we've published um, uh, the capital allocation priorities um, in 2021, uh, 2020's annual reports and accounts. So that sort of talks to the order of where we spend our cash, should there be any. So obviously we wish to maintain the um, strong balance sheet that we've got. Um, we are investing in our core business. The trade counter rollout clearly is, is a good example. We're also refreshing uh, a good deal of our uh, plants and equipment around uh, the country, but again, that's not capital intensive. Um, we will continue to to offer an ordinary dividend, and we've we've sort of stated our um, dividend policy has been twice covered on, on earnings, so um, that's um, in line with a, a pretty a pretty good upper quartile um, place in the market, and our shareholders uh, that they're comfortable with that. M um, and A, the, the, I do have a, a question on M and A, which. Um, has been raised, so perhaps I can ask, answer that now. I think there are one or two things that um, um, that we would look at in, in M&A. Um, the question around whether they're weaker during COVID, I think you have to look at the objectives and what we're trying to achieve as a business. I think we've got really good share um, and you look at where we're strong, we're, we're targeting different customer segments. I think the other thing where we are targeting is um, there's around, you know, bits of the market, bits of the product set that we're perhaps not as strong in. We're traditionally very strong in carpet um, and less so in other areas, things like ceramics and, and artificial grass and the like, uh, where we've got a relatively low share. I think there are perhaps some acquisition opportunities in those spaces, which are more aimed at our sort of objectives of infilling that kind of complete customer service offer, uh, where we could see some opportunities um, rather than kind of taking advantage of weak competitors doing things that we can't really do. So I think there is a, a kind of a half an eye on keeping some perhaps capital uh, for opportunities that arise in that space. And then after that, then we will clearly return surplus cash uh, to shareholders. Uh, and that's the uh, what sits behind the statement that we've made uh, last week. Um, and we will announce a bit further information on that uh, in, in March. Really, the last slide uh, before I summarise is around ESG. Um, we published our ESG strategy in May. Um, and this is something that, um, as distributors, is we're in a slightly um, unusual place from an environmental perspective in that we are here to serve to the market. And manufacturers will make a range of products and, and our customers demand a range of products. So primarily, uh, we're here to, to service that particular need. Um, but I think we also, as market leader, have an opportunity to influence and play a part in um, improving the sustainability of the industry, really. And I think that's something that we've been talking to in particular talking to manufacturers about some of our customers have got more um, more insight and more skin in the game in that particular space, particularly some of the um, local authorities and some of the large uh, multiple retailers, this is a key focus for them. But the manufacturers and the suppliers are very much working with us to see how we can move products uh, into a sustainable space and also what kind of role we can play in end of life recovery of product, for example. So that's something that we talk about in our ESG strategy and we'll increasingly see aligned uh, with our business strategy going forward. There are some specific actions we've taken um, and more will be announced on the social side of our um, community support that we offer to our businesses. But certainly we, we've made, announced already some improvements in the way that we go about the environmental side of our business. So moving our fleet, certainly our company car fleet to be hybrid, um, reducing our um, energy consumption and moving to um, sustainable energy production, that kind of thing. So that's within our control. It's something that we'll be announcing uh, more on in our March results. So it's something that's incredibly important for us and we'll see as an increasing part of our uh, discussion um, and strategy going forward. So just in summary then, I think, as I said, for, for those new to the headroom story, you know, we are market leaders, we are distributors, and we act in that sort of middle, middle place. We've got an extremely strong business, extremely strong business model. Um, um, but we are going through this change program. You know, we're not sitting on our laurels. Apologies for some background noise there. Not sitting on our laurels, um, and we've got a huge change agenda that we're halfway through, 
Um, and I think the exciting thing for me is around the growth story. We've got great opportunity in new customer segments that we've not targeted, and there's a large market for us to go at. ESG is clearly an increasing commitment for, for lots of businesses, not least us. And I think, again, as industry leader, we're, we're perfectly placed to uh, coordinate the manufacturer's efforts in that way uh, and work with uh, some of our key customers. So that kind of brings me to the end of, of, of the slides, but I'll perhaps do is a bit of questions. Fantastic, Chris. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the top right-hand corner of your screen. But just while Chris takes a few moments to review those questions submitted today already, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Chris, as you can see, we've had a number of questions that you've kindly answered a couple of on the way through, but there's a few more just on that Q&A tab. If I just may ask you just to click on Q&A, start at the top, and um, where appropriate to do so, just read out the question and give your response, please. And yeah, I will do. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Um, so Scott Thames asked a question around divesting of the European assets. I think that, that's a question that we have been asked. I think it's something that we're looking at. As I mentioned, we dispose of the Swiss business. And, and you think about what the capital deployed and the capital return is. You know, we are predominantly a UK business. Um, what we have said is that, that we'll, we'll look at the performance of those overseas assets and where appropriate they may be better off in, in others' hands and the Swiss business was sold to management. Um, and I think we'll look at each market in turn. Um, so we remain in France and we remain in the Netherlands. The French business has underperformed for a while and we spent a little bit of time trying to improve the quality in terms of that business. And um, I'm pleased to say that they are moving back into profits and generating, generating return. So I think it's something that we're keeping under watch, but we're looking to improve the quality of those businesses before uh, we do anything more uh, in the short order. Um, Simon C has asked, um, with a compelling digital offer, would, I, would we ever look at B2C? Um, I did use a sort of screw fix analogy earlier and, and they've neatly sort of straddled the B2B and B2C offer. I think from a board perspective, it's something that we're aware um, is an opportunity for us. You know, increasingly people are looking for digital consumption and looking at online. Um, remember, of course, our customers are B2B customers, they're retailers. So we wouldn't want to necessarily um, alienate our customer groups. But I think there's also, you know, an increasing willingness for people to participate in all areas of the marketplace. So I think it's, again, not something for now, but um, we are certainly making sure that our digital offer uh, is is relevant is right has got a consumer feel um, and that's something that we're going to continue to develop um, over the next 12 months or so um yeah scott m good question um what are the expectations on margins for this sort of emerging key accounts and, and large um, retail sector now we do have a, a large customer in, in that space uh, big q is, is, is one of our big is in fact our biggest customer and, and pretty much the only one that we've got in that very large space. Um, it does come with a lower um, gross margin, that's safe to say, um, as you might imagine. But because of the scale of the service um, and the sort of what unique way in which we service the customer, I think we can make decent operating margins out of that. So um, as I said, it, it comes at a different sort of shape and scale, but gross margins a bit lower, operating margins a bit higher. So I think we can offer a compelling solution to those customer groups um, and still make a a reasonable return on that. Um, Mark W, I think, has asked a very similar question, um, asking the same question as the previous one, but saying it, it does, it, it might attract lower gross, gross, lower gross margin. So I think, yes, that's right, it does. Um, but I think we can offset that with a more efficient um, delivery service. Okay, Mark W. Yeah, product areas. You, so Mark W asked a question, what might you consider other product areas in the UK leveraging your distribution strengths? I think that's something that the board uh, and I have discussed about whether they're sort of adjacent products um, that we could service. And certainly some of the ceramic businesses do stray into bathroom products and the like. But I think there's, there's certainly an, at the moment enough for us to go at. Um, the, the relative share that we've got in those new customer segments is relatively modest. And I mentioned some of the products that we consider floor covering or 
absolutely within our three spotlights around it and, and arguably wood and artificial glass. I think there's so much of an opportunity for us to, to target growth in those spaces that do um, have a close alignment with our operational handling skills and the way that we store product. Um, it makes sense for us to focus on that first um, and, and before we perhaps diversify elsewhere. Yeah, Matthew D has, has asked a, a key question that some of our shareholders have asked. What are the big moving parts required to take us to 7.5% margin? Um, and is that 7.5% margin a sort of staging post rather than an end goal? So that's, um, I'll, I'll try and answer that as best I can. I think the, I've got good line of sight over what the moving parts are, and I've talked about a couple of them on, on the slide deck. So by delivering some growth into the uh, large accounts and the key accounts and the large house builders, clearly we're able to use our operational gearing to our benefit. So we'll see a uh, drop through improvement in margin. So there's some growth through new customer segments. Um, in, in that type of space. Trade counters, we're looking to double the size of, and again, that comes with an enrichment in margin as a result. Um, specifically on some other areas, I suppose, cost efficiencies, we, we do think that there might be benefit of gross margins to be had. Um, and um, I suppose acting as a, um, as you get more growth, you're able to buy a little better. And as you start to consolidate some of the product ranges and supply, again, that's an area that we could perhaps uh, do a little better on gross margin and that's part of the strategy and part of the slide deck that you may have seen from uh, capital markets and other, and other presentations. So there is a little bit of a contribution from, from that. Um, and yes, that means that we, 7.5%, clearly it won't just be a cliff. You know, this is a glide path and um, it may well mean that we do get carried, uh, carried beyond that. So I think with more growth and, and top line, I can see that the gross margin and, and therefore the operating margin would hopefully exceed that. Um, well, I think on the, uh, there's a question around growth. So um, there's a question, uh, apologies if I pronounce your name wrong, but Oligario S. Um, in light of all the initiatives, uh, what type of organic growth should we expect for 2022? Well, I think all I can do at the moment is point to guidance that's in the market at the moment. Um, so they do have us with relatively modest growth uh, for 22. So you know, who knows what the demand curve is going to be? Um, what we are doing, I suppose, is trying to focus on areas that we can step into. So growth in those customer segments, we've been right. Our home segment, if you like, our traditional segment, will, will be subject to whatever the RMI and the, and the consumer spend patterns do this year um, and also indeed on, on the commercial demand curve so who, who knows um, we've we've had a go at that and some of the um, consensus has got us with some some organic growth in there. Uh, Scott M's asked a question around can you talk around any success you've had with new key accounts uh, not yet is the answer um, we'll publish that in our March update so we we have got contracts and we've signed a new customer up um, which is going well and is in the early stages. So what I'm intending to do is, is kind of wrap that up. Um, it's early days um, um, and um, wrap that sort of story up in the March announcement with a, a bit more colour um, and hopefully talk about what it's meant and, and um, try and get some good quotes in there. Oligari OS has asked another question around sort of the, the 2022 out. And again, I'm going to have to point you, I'm afraid, to, to Bloomberg and the consensus that you can see on there. Um, they're, they're, we're, we're content that uh, the board are content that the, the numbers in the market are, are broadly where uh, we'd expect to see for 2022. Um, Matthew D has asked a question around the kind of equation of how do you um, define paraphrasing, but how, how do you define what uh, surplus cash is? Um, and um, we, we we have published, um, as I said, our capital allocation priorities about what that might mean and in terms of sort of leverage and debt. Um, uh, but obviously, I'm also conscious that um, we don't want to necessarily do everything in one go and hence our kind of conversation in the in the trading update that we'll, we'll perhaps announce a bit more detail in March. But as you might imagine, um, we have got a number of options ahead of us and also function of time. And one of the, interestingly, one of the analysts sort of quotes to us was, well, if you know, 
failure to distribute something doesn't mean you've lost it. It's still there in the balance sheet. So I think we're taking a, a kind of progressive, pragmatic view to that. So um, we'll update a little bit more detail around what we're intending to do and, and we'll announce the, um, the distribution and our thoughts on that in March. Um, Oligari OS has asked, do I see any change in the competitive landscape in, in, in light of the consolidating effort of some of the competitors? Um, uh, yes and no is the answer to that. I think the um, one of the features of the market has been consolidations happened for, for many years and we've been the beneficiaries of, of that in the past. I think um, there have been one or two in, in recent times where um, I suppose the, the, that competitive situation exists already. So some of the businesses that are looking to combine, there's been a number of buyouts in recent times. Those, mar those businesses have already been competitors of ours. Um, one or two have now obviously joined forces. Now that will undoubtedly lead to some changes, but I think in general terms, those, those people have always been competitors of ours in some shape or form. Um, and um, I suspect that will remain the case uh, going forward. So um, it, it does mean that we do need to be um, on our toes. And I think it makes it, good competition is healthy. And, and I think it, it, it's good for us to, to have to keep fit and, and keep sharp in the market in, in order to remain uh, successful. So yeah, I think that's, that's probably the changes we'll see is that um, we just have to sharpen our, uh, sharpen our approach. Um, commercial RMI. Um, there's a question here about commercial RMI. Can I please talk about the buckets within this? So you've listed out in your question schools, hospitals, offers, uh, offices, and, and yes, all of those are indeed um, in that category. As I said, we focus more on the products than the end destination of where it's going. So uh, we tend to define um, our commercial sector as products that are commercial in nature rather than where they go. So the outlook um, for each of those segments is obviously difficult to predict, but the conversations I've had with um, manufacturers and competitors and, and, um, and, and other businesses is that um, I think there is a general expectation that schools might get back onto some refurb work. So they spent a lot of their budgets in the last couple of years on health and safety measures and, and protecting against infection and the like. So um, I think we're rather hopeful that, that some of that spend will now go back onto the refurb work that's, that's overdue. And the same goes for hospitals and, um, and sort of health institutions generally, that budgets and, and quality of flooring um, uh, should now sort of be addressed rather than going on the screens and, and uh, PPE and the like. So that's the sort of general thought that we might actually have a bit of a, an education season, which typically happens in August, for example, might actually happen this year. And it's been very, very muted in the last couple of years. Offices, again on the RMI, there is a there is a view that offices might now start to come back a little bit, and, and it's been very difficult um, over the last eighteen months with hybrid working and remote working. It's, it's simply people have been handed offices back rather than continuing to use them and refurb them. So I think those deferred spend um, ideas um, may well now start to come back on the table. There's some some space has been repurposed, which again is is fine for us because it means we get the opportunity to. Do to refloor the, the site. So I think there is a bit of quiet enthusiasm about the office refurb market, um, certainly perhaps in the second half of the year. Um, and it's, it's um, yeah, it, it's, it's been better than it was last year, put it that way. Um, Matthew Dees asked another question about inflation. Um, are we able to recover materials and labor across inflation? And what price rise to, does Headland need to push that through? Uh, in 2022. Um, so the feature of the flooring market is that typically um, non-product inflation is difficult for uh, for us to, to pass on. So in years where there's been very little product inflation, we've ended up having to um, absorb um, overhead cost inflation, uh, labor inflation, um, um, or try and create efficiencies to offset that. In it, quite the contrary this year, and indeed towards the end of last year, um, raw materials and product prices have been increasing across the board and you would have seen that in other sectors in your home lives um, which has meant that we're able to, to pass those on and therefore cover the cost inflation that we're seeing so the labor inflation is probably the most interesting one where um, there is a general labor inflation but of course um, that's uh, that's also dialed up in certain areas and job types so 
uh, things like drivers, we've seen double digit wage inflation, which we've already covered um, and had to, to find. Now we've been able to offset some of that with the efficiencies that we saw last year and the driver reductions I mentioned. But that is a feature of our sector. And, and as I said, the, the product supply prices that we've been able to push into the market as everybody has in the sector has meant that this year um, we've been able to offset the cost inflation we've seen in other areas. Chris, thank you very much. You, you, you've answered every single question we've had come through. And of course, there are any further questions that come through, you will have the opportunity to review those. And we're published responses to all those questions Chris has answered on the Investor Meet Company platform. Chris, perhaps before we redirect investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is uh, particularly appreciated by you and the company, I could ask you just for a few closing comments, please. Yeah, I think that you know, the long short of it is we've got a great business with great heritage. We've been market leading for many years. Um, but actually, strangely for a market leader, I think the growth opportunity remains ahead of us. You know, we've, we've, we're stepping into new territories, we are deploying new technologies, we've got new skills in the business. So it remains an exciting place to be. Uh, and I'm really encouraged by the sort of start that we've had, both in terms of the customer segment penetration and also just the trading. The start of the year has been great. So it just put a, a kind of lift in the step for the people in the field. So, um, yeah, I think that's the, the, the takeaway for me is that we've got a, a great solid business, but one that's it's going to get better. That's fantastic. Chris, thank you for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order Chris and the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Headlam Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all. Thank you.